Okay, so I'd like to commence with the with this uh, uh, incident uh, which had occurred during the time of Umar radiallahu anhu, uh, when the uh, Jews of uh, Medina approached him uh, and said to him uh, that there is such a verse that has been revealed uh, unto the Muslims in the Quran Kareem, which if it was revealed to us, we would have comm commemorated and ce celebrated on that day. Umar radiallahu anhu was obviously no ordinary person. He was given great foresight by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, uh, he immediately uh, understood the question and knew the answer. And he said, indeed, I know exactly which verse you're making reference to. Uh, that verse was revealed, and not only do I know the verse, but I know when it was revealed, and uh, where it was revealed, and on which day it was revealed as well. And the verse is, اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا. This is a verse of uh, Surah Al-Ma'idah, wherein Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares that this day have I completed, uh, perfected your deen for you, and I have completed my favors upon you, and I have chosen Islam as your deen and your way of life. This verse was revealed on the plains of Arafah on the occasion of Hajjat al uh, when Rasulullah was uh, uh, on his camel. So Umar radiallahu and it was a Friday. So Umar radiallahu anhu responded, indeed, we, uh, I not only know the day, uh, uh, the verse, but I know the day and the place where it was revealed. And uh, uh, this is said to be the last verse that was revealed to Rasulullah Now, our understanding of deen uh, is based on these five pillars of Islam. Uh, shahada, uh, faith, belief, salah, prayer, psalm, fasting, zakat, almsgiving, and hajj, pilgrimage. Uh, if anybody does these five, he believes that he has reached the epitome and the height of adherence to deen. However, uh, deen is not contained in these acts of worship only. Deen consists of imaniyat, belief, which is fundamental and cardinal to the acceptance of everything else and uh, cardinal and conditional for us to uh, gain entry into Jannah. So Imaniyat is the central point, which is belief. Then Ibadat, which we mentioned, the five pillars of Islam, an important aspect uh, of, uh, uh, of our deen as well. But there are these other three aspects of deen which most are oblivious of. Akhlaqiyat, character. There isn't nobody, you know, a person can choose to be vulgar, he can choose to be rude, he can choose to be uh, uh, negligent of the rights of his uh, neighborhood, he can choose to be uh, uh, negligent of, of, of uh, his co-workers uh, and, and uh, their sensitivities. Mu'amalat, also an integral part. Who amongst us uh, would think that when, when we go and open our shops every day, we are actually doing an, a, a fundamental aspect uh, uh, of which, which is intrinsic to our religion. Who considers that when we open our business or transact in any way, that our business dealings have to be in accordance with specific criteria and conditions, which if we, if we exceed the limits of, we can be compromising our earnings. We can be compromising the transaction. We can be, uh, in fact, even uh, uh, being, get involved in haram uh, transaction for that matter. And then last but not the least, our mu'ashara, our social conduct, our behavior, uh, also an integral part of our faith. So uh, generally, we, we, we've, we've contained deen only into ibadah. But it's, it's every facet of our life, uh, everything that we do, whether it's our commercial activity, whether it's our recreational activity, whether it's our private life, everything is governed by the sharia. And 
in this verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِي غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَا يُقْبَلَ مِنْهِ That if anybody chooses any other way, any other tradition, any other culture, other than that shown by Islam, it will not be accepted. So we've, we, we must understand that Islam is the only way for Muslims to gain salva- salvation. Not only in, 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 in respect of our ibadah, but in every other facet of our life. Coming to the aspect of, of earning and commerce and transaction, uh, this is a hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam طَلَبُ كَسْبِ الْحَلَالِ فَرِيضَةٌ بَعْدَ الْفَرِيضَةٌ The seeking of halal earning is a fard obligation after the performance of the fard salah. Now, pay attention to this. That just as fard salah is an obligation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained earning halal, consuming halal, also to be an obligation, and it's not a choice for a believer. It is absolutely obligatory upon the believer that what he earns, what he consumes is in accordance with the dictates of the Sharia. In a hadith of Rasulullah Sallam, he says, Al-halalu bayyinun wal haramu bayyinun. The perimeters of halal are clearly defined and that of haram are clearly defined. Wa baynahuma mushtabihatun. And you will find this comment sometimes. Look, just tell me if it's halal or haram. No, there is the area that Rasulullah mentioned, the gray area. Between the perimeters of halal and haram is the gray area, that of mustabihat, that of doubt. And obviously, haram we have to abstain from. But mustabihat, Rasulullah specifically instructed us, beware of the mustabihat, because it is very likely indulging in mustabihat will lead you into indulgence in haram. In every facet of our life, we, we generally would consult, whether it is uh, uh, legal aspects, whether it is our financial aspects, we would consult with the professionals and experts. However, it is regretted that, you know, when it comes to masail of uh, uh, salah, and zakat and fasting and hajj and when will my, my wudu breaks and when can I uh, wear the hoof and when does the masa on the hoof end uh, and what nullifies my fast and uh, what uh, are the do's and don'ts of hajj that we will all consult go to the ulama and consult but in every other aspect of our deen and especially our business how much of us realize that we have to consult we do not want to enter into any contract we do not want to engage into any transaction we do not want to engage in any form of trade which compromises our deal so in this aspect of business it is absolutely essential that we also consult with the with the muftis and with the ulama so that they could guide us in respect of uh, the the aspect of the business uh, business that we conduct during the time of Umar radiallahu anhu, he did not allow anybody to trade in the market of Medina unless he was au fait and well versed with the masail and the rulings of trade. That much of emphasis was placed by Umar radiallahu anhu that uh, uh, people that wanted to trade in the markets of Medina could not trade unless they were versed with the masail of trade. And the position of the trader and the businessman is no ordinary one. Uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has, has uh, elevated the status of the trader to such an extent that his, uh, the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, tajir sadduq al-ameen, the honest and truthful trader, the trustworthy trader, the truthful trader, he will be raised on the day of Qiyamah with the Anbiya, what the Siddiqeen and the Shuhada. Imagine the elevation. So we should not undermine uh, and be oblivious of the fact that traders in Islam hold a very lofty position. It is not just an ordinary position. Their services, their contribution, their support to various facets of the community and to various aspects of deen is known through the centuries. But 
all we have to do is we have to trade and transact with the correct mindset in everything we do, not only in trade, but in everything we do. We should understand and these intentions is actually the mindset which we have to introspect and on a daily basis reflect on our actions. Is our mindset correct? Is our intentions correct? If our intention and mindset is not correct, it will have this ripple effect across everything we do, our action, our behavior, our attitude our performance and our results, not only the material outcome, but also the spiritual outcome. So always, you know, profit before profit. What is the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, teaching of Rasulullah What are the injunctions of the Sharia? What is uh, the ordinance of the Quran regarding this particular aspect that I'm engaging in? Before we consider profit, let's consider what is the prophetic instruction and teaching. Now, uh, in the context of halal and haram, uh, we all know that halal is a general term, which means lawful. So all those acts which are permitted in any sphere of life, whether it be uh, business, uh, private, uh, worship, political life, Everything that is lawful is, is, is halal. And every act that is unlawful, uh, that is forbidden, is haram. Whether it be, again, just our character, our behavior, uh, our relationship with our parents, uh, whether it be vulgarity, whether it be other acts which have been clearly forbidden by the Sharia, uh, they all fall within the category of haram. So halal means lawful and permitted, and haram means that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, prohibited and uh, uh, we have, as Muslims are not permitted to do. In the context of dietary law, obviously it refers to foods and drinks uh, uh, that are permissible. Uh, and in the general context, it refers to all those items which Muslims are permissible to use. Okay, the common misconception when you talk about halal and haram, is people think it's contained and restricted to slaughter, and it's restricted to meat products. So if you if you buy meat or meat items or uh, processed meats, then the uh, rules of halal and haram uh, come into play. Uh, so that's a common misconception. But there are there are guidelines, specific guidelines given uh, by the Sharia, which which far transcend just our consumption and far transcend just uh, meat products. These are, uh, there are general guidelines that are given by the Sharia with regards uh, that which is prohibited. So uh, blood is, is, is haram uh, alaykum al maytata wa dam, carrion is forbidden and prohibited, blood is prohibited, uh, then uh, the hadith also uh, uh, talks about donkeys and mules being prohibited, carnivorous animals being prohibited, insects being prohibited, rodents being prohibited, uh, reptiles being prohibited. And obviously we know about uh, pigs. Uh, all part of the pig is haram, it's najis, it's impure, uh, napak and forbidden. And similarly, alcohols, liquor, beverages, that which, in, which intoxicates uh, is also forbidden and prohibited. For businessmen, I'd like to just, uh, firstly, uh, uh, because this is becoming very common, uh, Muslim businessmen are engaging extensively in, in, in the franchise industry. Uh, and uh, without, without even realizing, uh, you know, whether the, the, uh, the, the, the franchise in question is, in accordance with the Sharia or not? That is the first thing. Does it comply? Uh, and generally on the outward, it may appear that now it's a halal food restaurant uh, or, or it's a halal franchise that I'm, I'm, I'm buying into. Uh, we, we unfortunately uh, do not understand the consequences of franchise industries 
whether it be, uh, you know, your, your eateries and restaurants or whether it be uh, things like your, your petrol stations and your convenience stores that are attached to them. Uh, they, indeed, very common, but the reality is that there are, uh, 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 you know, once you sign the contract, uh, then you are, you are bound. Uh, what does the contract say? The contract might not tell you that we'll, we'll, we, you, know, you have to sell haram products, but the contract will say that the franchisor will determine exactly what you can and what you cannot do. If we, we might give the contract to an attorney to, to, to look through, uh, do we take these contracts to the ulama for them to guide us and, and, and see exactly, is there anything in here that I might be compromising myself going forward? Now, many of these contracts, the franchisor would determine what is halal, what you can sell and what you can't sell. Sometimes it would even determine, uh, it would even state that the franchisor will determine what you sell in the business. So we've had several instances, especially in the uh, 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 petrol industry and the, the four, four courts uh, convenience stores, where people were compelled to sell products that did not meet the halal criteria. To the extent that uh, at one stage, there was a businessman that came complaining and did not know what to do because the franchisor compelled them to even sell uh, pork products and alcohol products within the convenience stores. So it's imperative that uh, we again go back to the uh, uh, ulama, to the experts, as well to ensure that the contracts that we're entering into are compliant, not only from a legal perspective, but also from a Sharia perspective. Now I'd like to take you through the uh, some aspects of the industry and just highlight uh, some critical areas which sometimes we're uh, oblivious of. If we take the dairy industry, you know, nobody walks into a, a, a dairy and, and uh, Alhamdulillah now with, with growing awareness, people are getting more and more away and we are understanding what is critical in which uh, part of the industry. But generally, uh, there is this oblivion uh, and people say, no, it's fine, dairy, what could be wrong with a milk uh, product that I purchase? Now, uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, you know, in, in South Africa, most of our dairies, uh, in fact, almost all of them are compliant with uh, uh, halal regulations and are being monitored and certified accordingly. But what could be wrong with milk besides the homogenization and pasteurization that takes place? Uh, what could be wrong? Ask yourself that question. But in many countries, fortification in, in, in South Africa, it hasn't happened yet. But fortification in many countries in Africa is happening. So they fortify, uh, they identify a, a, a nutritional deficiency in the community and then fortify these staple foods with, uh, 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 with vitamins. And sometimes these vitamins are not halal compliant. So we, we, we can't just take it on face value. Take a product like, uh, like yogurt. You know, uh, in the old days, yogurt was made from uh, at home. They would take milk and, and, and our mothers and grandmothers would curdle the milk and they would make yogurt at home. These days, yogurt is bought from the uh, supermarket shelves. Nobody makes yogurt at home any longer. What are the problems? Uh, in yogurt. Now, stabilizer, sometimes they would, the ingredients would state gelatin. Sometimes they would just say stabilizer. What is the stabilizer that is used in yogurt? Is it gelatin? Is it starch? Is it pectin? If it's gelatin, is it halal gelatin? Is it porcine gelatin? Is it, is it a blend of both halal and haram gelatin? If it's a, a flavored yogurt in the a, a, a red colored yogurt, maybe a strawberry or cherry a yogurt, what uh, a colorant are they using? You know, is the colorant the E120 that is from uh, insect source? Uh, critical ingredients and that we've got to be aware of. So whether it's in South Africa or whether you're traveling abroad, you've got to be cognizant, uh, you know, just don't go to the breakfast table and say, no, I just had some yogurt. What does what is the stabilizer content in the yogurt? 
similarly with cheeses, you know, uh, cheese is a, is, is a product of milk. How is cheese manufactured? They need to coagulate the milk. And what do they use as a coagulant? Commonly, either microbial relatives used, plant relatives used, or an animal relatives used. Uh, now, the rennet enzyme uh, can be from various sources, and there are other enzymes besides rennet as well used in the dairy industry, uh, like lipase. Now, if it comes from a, a haram animal, it's problematic. Uh, and similarly, the byproduct of, of rennet uh, is whey uh, of cheese manufacture. So, and whey is used in, in a plethora of products across the board, whether it's your chocolate industry, your bakery industry, your confectionery industry, or even your muscle building industry where protein is extend, extensively used. Uh, so if the rennet is wrong in cheese manufacture, the whey protein will be problematic as well. The bakery industry, and this is probably, you know, this is such a common staple product as well. I mean, everybody eats bread. With every meal, there's bread. Besides the, 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 the confectionery and the uh, cakes and, and, and desserts that we, uh, that we buy, uh, the bakery industry is also a very common uh, uh, and critical area. We go, walk into a bakery and buy a loaf of French toast without thinking twice. Uh, but there are ingredients that are critical. In the old days, you know, if you bought a, a loaf of bread, uh, that bread wouldn't last more than a day or two. The next day you'd find it getting a bit uh, hard. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, the ingredients that were used in bread at the time were very basic. It was bread, salt, water and flour, uh, you know, that, that, that you could make your bread with. These days, it's very different. Uh, in those days, if you bought bread and you left it for a week, you probably see it getting moldy like this. But uh, now you can buy uh, uh, bread. The consistency is amazing. The texture is amazing. The shelf life, you can buy a loaf of bread today and have it a week later, 10 days later, and it would be as fresh as, as, as the day you purchased it. So what is it that makes bread different from what it was before? There are a whole host of ingredients. You no longer just use ordinary bread, uh, wheat flour. Now you're using a bread premix. What does that bread premix contain? It contains a whole host of enzymes, whether it, uh, whether it is, sometimes it's, it's, it's a composite premix. Sometimes it's, it's a premix that contains flour improvers. Uh, amino acids, you know, and, and very commonly we find, uh, you wonder what is this, you know, what are these Chinese ladies doing with heaps of hair? But a very common ingredient in the bakery industry is L-cysteine. And L-cysteine, uh, uh, you know, is, is manufactured in China and in India uh, extensively from human hair. There are other sources of amino acid L-cysteine uh, you know, uh, from uh, a plant, so from synthetic source, and also from a uh, 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 poultry feather source. But a very common source is uh, human hair. So, you, you know, you, you, you would be eating a, a, a slice of bread, not, not even realizing. You know, if you normally see a strand of hair in your soup or in your food, uh, you cringe. But uh, people don't even, are not even aware that many of the uh, bakery products uh, contain amino acids, uh, which are from, from a non-halal source. Enzymes are also uh, extensively used. You know, uh, your amylases, uh, starch amylases, which is fine, uh, and other uh, uh, enzymes from bacteria, which are also fine. But there are enzymes used from, from animal source, uh, which is problematic. Then again, in the bakery industry, we have fortification that happens where uh, bread products are, uh, you know, the premixes are fortified uh, with vitamins and which also can be problematic. Baking fats. So you say, no, I just buy a loaf of bread. I, I know the guys, uh, it's a non-halal bakery, but uh, I just go and buy a loaf of bread. 
uh, and, uh, you know, I've seen the guy's flower is fine. Are we aware that animal fats are also used in the bakery industry? Lard is also used in the bakery industry. And what is lard? It is pig fat. So we've got to be conscious that, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the fats that are used are also compliant and are from a vegetable source. So you have, now you have a halal, you have halal flour and you have uh, a halal premix. The pan grease that they grease the pans with, is that compliant? Because pan grease can also be problematic where animal fats are used in the uh, process. And even if you have even the pan grease fine, uh, is the bakery careful about what they use to grease the pans? or to uh, 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 grease their, their products or base their products, uh, glaze their products. It's in these uh, brushes that you see, uh, uh, you know, the one on the left is a, is a pig bristle brush. And 90% of natural bristle brushes that you find used in, in the food industry uh, are from pig hair. Uh, you go to pick shops as well, you find them, you know, Basting away on the, uh, and if the guy, the guy is, is not even aware that he's using a, a pork bristle brush to base his, uh, uh, to base the, the food that he's preparing. Uh, in the Asian region and uh, Far East region like China and Thailand, uh, the, the, the use of, of, of cricket flour is becoming very common. So, you know, the crickets that, that we find in our, in our home during the summer season and in, and in our uh, uh, backyards that go uh, along cricketing away, uh, they are harvesting them and making cricket flour, uh, flour from them, which is also being used in the bakery and food industry. So, uh, you know, fortunately, South Africa hasn't got there yet, but uh, we've got to be cognizant of these critical areas, Con the confectionery industry, and we all love uh, confection. Gummies, who doesn't love gummies? Uh, although it's very popular with children, but increasingly adults are enjoying these confectionery products. And uh, what goes into them? Have we, even, have we even thought what goes into these products? Uh, gelatin is a very common ingredient in these gummy products. Uh, and you know, I picked up this product from one of the Middle Eastern countries while, whilst I was traveling. Uh, sour wine gums. Look at the content. Porcine gelatin, which is pig gelatin. So, uh, you know, an imported product if you're buying, if you're not aware of the halal certification, don't just think, ah, no, it'll be fine. Be careful uh, lest you, uh, you know, have yourself and your family uh, uh, enjoying and licking away on a pork ingredient. Confectionery products, you know, we, we, we love chocolates. Uh, it's very common. What goes into chocolate manufacture? There are lots of products that actually contain uh, liquor. So you, you, you're traveling abroad, uh, whether it's uh, in Belgium, who are specialists and connoisseurs in chocolate, uh, uh, or whether you, you, you're just passing through a duty-free area. And, and today we don't have to travel to get imported products. Uh, let alone your, your supermarkets, you find home industry people also, uh, you know, uh, on, on uh, social media advertising imported products. We should be cognizant, are these products that we are selling uh, compliant or not? So that's the, the, the confectionery industry. Let's look at the beverage industry. Again here, you know, we, we, we don't think twice, it's just a soft drink or it's just a juice. What goes into it? Is the flavor and compliant? Is there any alcohol uh, liquor used in the, in, in, in the flavor component? We are buying a, a, a fruit juice. Uh, it's a 100% fruit juice blend. Uh, cranberry or grape uh, uh, or apple. Now we must understand that although it's a 100% fruit juice blend, there are ingredients that are used in these products which are problematic. Uh, to, to clarify uh, juice, uh, they use a decloudifying agent, which uh, can be from a, a, a chemical mineral source, or it can also be gelatin. As a, as a flocculent, gelatin is commonly used 
in in uh, concentrate. So if you, even if you're buying a juice that is not clear, uh, you may be buying a, a pear juice. Uh, but what is the sweetener? Because it's a hundred percent pure juice, the sweetener that they use in there will be a grape juice concentrate or an apple concentrate. Is that concentrate perhaps not clarified and uh, decloudified with a uh, gelatin? Uh, uh, flocculent, uh, flavored waters, you know, it's uh, just water. Well, why do we need the halal stamp on water? Come on, it's just water. Besides the flavoring that is used in water, are we even cognizant of the fact that there are filter aids that are used by the uh, uh, water industry, uh, which can contain, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, bone charcoal from animal source? Uh, we spoke about the flavorings and the and the colorings that could be prob problematic, and we spoke about the gelatin also uh, that is used in these juice products. So you have a halal product and you package it in a product which is contaminated. We look at a uh, you know a a, a tetra pack uh, or a canned uh, food product. It may contain baked beans, but we're not aware of the fact that in the manufacture of these packaging materials, there are animal ingredients uh, that are also used, which could compromise the halal product in which it is packed. So these are the type of critical ingredients we've picked up in packaging, which needs to be screened and scrutinized to ensure that the halal product in, uh, which is packed therein uh, is not compromised uh, through migration. Transportation and warehouse logistics is also a very critical area. So you have a halal product and it's transported where the risks of contam contamination exist, whether it be in the warehousing or whether it be in the transportation logistics. So it's an entire supply chain that has to be monitored. And you, you know, it, it, uh, it makes you wonder that uh, uh, Muslim countries have lagged behind in this area. The first halal port in the world was in Holland, in Rotterdam. Uh, you know, and this is way back in 2006 where they identified this area uh, where the almost, uh, you know, uh, 30 million Muslims uh, are receiving products from all over the world, halal products, and they've created a halal uh, section within the port to cater and facilitate uh, halal logistics. The pharmaceutical industry is, in, is, is uh, also very critical and generally, uh, you know, uh, 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 the doctor prescribed the medication and we have to uh, administer that medication. We've got to take that medication. But this is, it is important for people in the medical field as well as important for people in the pharmaceutical field and uh, uh, that we are cognizant. If, if, if we are not cognizant, of the fact that there are a huge amount of uh, problematic ingredients used in medication, whether it be capsules, whether it be uh, 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 vitamin tablets, uh, whether it be uh, vaccines that are that are administered, there are critical ingredients. And uh, uh, if we are not cognizant of them, and we prescribe them on many occasions, we face a situation where a doctor prescribes a medication and the lady or the, uh, the, the gentleman or, or will query the product from our helpline. And uh, as per the information we have on file, the product is not compliant. So it becomes quite difficult and uh, uncomfortable even for our uh, professionals where the patient now uh, doesn't want to administer the product because there is a haram ingredient. So we should uh, you know, uh, ensure that even the medication we are prescribing is compliant. Yes, of course, where there are no alternatives and, and you know, the, the Sharia has made provision for those, uh, you know, where to save life, etc. And in, in cases of uh, need and necessity, uh, that we're able to utilize certain medication which are not fully compliant to Islamic law. However, uh, uh, in general, uh, people are not aware of the fact that, uh, uh, you know, the tablet that I'm having, capsules, yes, everybody's aware, capsules are gelatin-based. 
but there are many tablets that are manufactured, whereas a bonding agent, gelatin, is also used in tablets. Uh, the product I showed you in the previous slide, uh, the Premarin product, uh, you know, uh, it was found that it contains estrogen from pregnant mares urine. The Vitatheon product was containing uh, 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 blood hemoglobin at one stage. And if we don't, as the industry, uh, as, as uh, Muslim professionals uh, in the field, uh, alert the industry about it, the manufacturers about our concerns, uh, there will never be a change. Uh, these haram ingredients will continue, continue to be used. So necessity and emergency is a separate uh, aspect. And yes, we've always, you know, in medication, we've used a reactionary approach. We haven't gone and actively pursued this because of the difficulty that, that uh, consumers will face and, and, and patients will face. So it's been an effort uh, and it's a long journey towards uh, uh, working with uh, people like the Islamic Medical Association and with medical professionals uh, and with the industry uh, to make them aware of uh, areas of concern. And with this growing awareness, change will definitely happen. This uh, very commonly, you know, diabetes is very common, especially amongst our Indian community in, uh, in South Africa. And this was a typical case uh, uh, in point where they were using a magnesium stearate of animal source and uh, with a bit of effort uh, uh, that was made, uh, you know, through medical professionals and with the manufacturer directly, they reformulated the product and used a plant-based stearate thereafter. The cosmetic industry, and, and yes, uh, you know, the, the trend is amazing, uh, not only in, in the Middle East and Southeast Asian region, but even within our own country, uh, where uh, uh, people are uh, more and more uh, using cosmetic products. Uh, and uh, therefore, you'll find, you know, for marketing purposes, even if, uh, if there's a nail polish that is being uh, sold, people will say it is halal compliant. Even the industry is aware now that, uh, you know, uh, Muslims need to use products which are compliant, even if it's nail polish, even if it's a, a non-consumable item, uh, it needs to be compliant. And you'll find a non-Muslim telling, you know, this one is, is permeable. Water will reach the, the bed of the nail. So uh, cosmetics is also an area which we have to be very cognizant of and, and uh, address. Uh, it's not only what you eat that is critical, but what, what you consume is also critical. And some of the products like lipsticks, uh, you know, you're using it around your, around your mouth. And yes, there is a percentage of a lipstick that will be consumed by the person. Uh, animal fats, glycerin, and uh, even your your, your colorants of uh, uh, non-halal source are extensively used. Skincare products and the use of uh, items like placenta uh, is also very common. So we should be cognizant of the fact that, uh, you know, it may be a cream that really works for you and it's, it's very, very, very nice. But uh, what does it contain? Uh, toiletry products are also of concern, whether it be your toothpaste uh, or whether it be your uh, your toothpicks. And uh, this is a very interesting incident. And many people say, but you know, why do you certify toothpicks? And that's exactly what we told the guy when he came here some 15, 16 years ago to certify the toothpicks that they were making, that uh, it's wood, you don't need to have certification for it. And uh, he taught us something. He said, no, you know, I can either coat these toothpicks with beeswax or I can coat them with uh, uh, animal fat, steer it. Uh, and when that happened, we immediately contacted uh, uh, Oral-B because they have a wax floss and an unwax floss, only to find out that the wax floss uses beeswax and the unwax floss was at the time using uh, an animal fat uh, steroid. So, uh, you know, it may seem very, very uh, insignificant, but yes, you are putting it in your mouth. So be careful. Hairbrushes. Commonly, you'll find hairbrushes using natural bristle. Uh, this brush was, was actually picked up uh, in Saudi Arabia, uh, where 
uh, this natural bow hairs were being used uh, uh, on this hairbrush uh, and uh, sold in a Muslim market. Uh, the import is perhaps not away and uh, consumers are totally oblivious. The uh, uh, apparel industry or leather wear that you use, whether, uh, uh, whether it's jackets or whether it's uh, shoes or whether it's handbags or whether it's attaché cases, the use of uh, pigskin is is uh, co common. So you know you buy a you buy a a a, a product uh, and you feel ah oh, it's just a handbag or it's just a shoe or just a jacket, but make sure I've just touched on a, a few of the areas uh, which uh, I, uh, are critical. There are many 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 other areas, but just as a teaser, we've given you. Uh, certain examples of products uh, which are critical and which people should uh, be aware of, be cognizant of, uh, and accordingly with education and awareness, we can accordingly uh, ensure that what we use is, is, is correct. And the industry will make that change when they come to know that Muslims require certain uh, products and, and require that certain ingredients not be used in products that are uh, uh, manufactured for the general community. Uh, we uh, are committed and we uh, try our best to ensure that consumers have access to authentic halal products. And yes, if you have any queries at, at any time, we have a national halal helpline that can assist you and guide you. Uh, and the number uh, of the national halal helpline is known to all, but for those that don't know it, 0861 Seven eight six triple one. Jazakumullah khair. Jazakumullah khairan to Morana for that uh, very in-depth in and insightful uh, presentation. It indeed is is a, a an eye opener uh, for myself on 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 many issues, and I'm sure that our participants and uh, those that are joining on YouTube have also found it very informative. Uh, I'd just like to check whether we have any questions from our participants uh, before we close the session, inshallah. Do we have any questions from the floor? don't see any questions coming up. So with that, we'd like to thank Moana for taking out his time in preparing for this presentation and uh, for delivering it as well on the Saturday morning. Uh, there is a question here, which says kindly share those items from which care should be taken. Uh, I think Moana has covered this uh, in the different uh, elements, the different parts of the presentation that he covered. Uh, highlighting those critical areas. Uh, is, are there any additional aspects to add to, to this question? Can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Is that a from Alana or the beautiful program, the presentation? What I mean by the question is that some of those products, like maybe from from cosmetic side or from confessionary side, which are known to have some elements of haram products. You know, if this can be shared like, okay, from uh, from toothpaste, this one, be, be careful of this. You know, then we know when we go to the marketplaces, we, we stay away from those products. This is my question or my observation. So that will okay, brother. Uh, what what you must do is keep in touch with our helpline. Our okay. Instagram also has uh, highlighted products from time to time that we identify to be uh, problematic and non-halal. And uh, if you keep in touch with our helpline, they will also send you a list of products in a specific category uh, which you have interest in. Okay, Barakallah.
I don't see any other more, other question. So with that, Jazakumullah uh, khairan to our participants, Jazakumullah khairan to Mulana Navlaki for delivering this presentation. And uh, inshallah, may Allah accept it. And uh, uh, please share this information, share the, the YouTube link with your family and friends to spread the knowledge and to create awareness on this very important topic. Uh, with that, we will close the, the YouTube uh, live uh, stream and we will continue with our Islamic Business Masterclass program. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.